Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and today our guest is Professor Patrick Kors. An assistant professor of history at Yale, Professor Kors teaches courses in U.S. international history and the history of European and international politics. He is the author of The Unfinished Peace After World War I. Professor Kors is currently working on a history of the Pax Americana, which reappraises American pursuits of a new world order from their origins to the Cold War and explores how far they contributed to the emergence of a more legitimate international system. Welcome, Professor Kors. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, let's begin with your first book, mm -hmm. The Unfinished Peace After World War I. Mm -hmm. What is its premise? Well, its premise in short is that it, in my interpretation, it would be misleading to regard the era after World War I as one marked by the illusion of peace, by the failure of making any kind of peace. What I'm looking at is rather the construction of something that emerged in the 1920s as a transatlantic peace system. But I also argue, and that is somewhat different from previous interpretations, that um, one shouldn't focus too much on the peace negotiations at Versailles in 1919. Uh, in looking for the origins of this peace, but rather look at efforts that were made in the 1920s to reform uh, what was originally um, a not so stable uh, international order at Versailles. And uh, that is what I'm looking at. And uh, I'm particularly interested in reappraising the role that the United States and Britain played in this uh, process. OK. And what drew you to this topic? Um, in a way, I've uh, always been generally interested in origins of wars and what made for workable, lasting peace systems, especially in the 20th century. And, uh, uh, and this uh, book offers, in some ways, an explanation of why it uh, came to a second world war. And that's, of course, a big question and uh, that has uh, sort of had my in caught my interest for, for a long time. And uh, one particular, um, I think, point here is that um, I've long been interested in transatlantic relations um, and in the role that the United States played in the emergence of a really global international order from the uh, 19th century onwards to the era of the Cold War. And so in all of this, um, I, I thought the era after World War I was an interesting one to focus on all these interests that I had. Okay. I imagine that um, there is quite a bit of um archival material out there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the research you needed to do for the book. Yes, um, it's at once, I guess, quite challenging, but also a lot of fun in a way, because I, I think that um, to be really valuable nowadays, um, history should be written in this kind of area as, as genuinely international history, which means that one has to go to a lot of archives in different countries. In my uh, projects, uh, this mainly re um, involves archival research in the United States, but also in, in Europe in particular, mm -hmm. in Britain, in France, uh, and in, in Germany. Um, it requires me to go to uh, Paris on a regular basis, so there are many sacrifices involved. Mm, yes, tough, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> um, in writing the book, um, did it? Um, did you think that perhaps there are any lessons um, to be learned here, for instance, um, regarding like the Middle East conflicts and other uh, regions that are in conflict? Um, I would say so, yes. I mean, it is always difficult to draw lessons from historical mm -hmm. periods and to find uh, very exact analogies, but I think uh, one of the things I'm trying to analyze in this book is what I, re I regard as the emergence of a Franco-German peace process with two very uh, distinct uh, states and sets of interests in, Germ in Weimar Germany of the time and France um, f um, having a lot of conflicts over salient issues. And so I'm not least looking um, at the question what an outside broker, a third mm -hmm. force, a kind of arbiter can do. Um, and in this particular case, what Britain and the United States could do to, uh, in a way, enable such a peace process to have any kind of success. And uh, this, of course, requires not least um, taking over international commitments. And the United States, after the First World War, was a power after the uh, treaty negotiations of Versailles um, and the rejection of the Treaty of Versailles by the American Congress that um, seemingly did not want to take on any international commitments to security, to European reconstruction. But as my book, I think, shows to a certain extent, this is partly a myth. So the, the difficulties involved um, for a power to actually play a constructive international brokering role 
um, I think are a central theme of the book and I think this is something that if we look at the Middle East nowadays or um, uh, efforts to, for example, reform the international financial order that seem to be quite you know, on the agenda, um, a, a lot of lessons can be drawn from the successes but also, of course, notably the failures of the interwar period. Okay. And you're working on a new book, A History of the Pax Americana. Mm -hmm. um, did the idea of that book grow out of this first book? Yes, to a certain extent. Um, I, I would like to um, say, first of all, that the Pax Americana is in quotation marks. Okay. So it's, 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 uh, it's a book about an idea, but also the translation of the idea of a kind of American piece, such okay. as Woodrow Wilson uh, tried to promote in 1918, 1919, but also the um, successive generations under the Roosevelt administration, the Truman administrations tried to uh, promote. And um, yes, uh, in, in a way, the, uh, the period that I'm especially interested in is marked by two world wars and two attempts to reorder inter the international system. And the United States played a very marked role in both attempts. So this book is a really a, an attempt to, uh, to try to look at this period in one coherent analysis, which is quite uh, somewhat of an undertaking. But um, I'm especially interested in these you know, lessons and learning processes that you mentioned. What was different after 1945? How far did, for example, American uh, policymakers try to draw lessons from the failures of Versailles, from the failures of stabilizing, for example, a democratic Germany in, in the 1920s? And what did they try to do differently under the conditions of the emerging Cold War? So uh, clearly there's a relation between the first book and the second book. All bo very boring, maybe. Not at all. Um, so. In terms of um, you know the new book that you're working on, I know you're in the process of writing it. Um, can you share any 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 of your findings at this point? Any highlights that we can look forward to reading about? Um, I think it's it's really an ongoing process, but I'm I've become ever more interested in. Um, looking at what I would call the history of ideas, not just the ideas of, let's say, uh, you know, the big, the big three in, um, at Versailles or the great statesmen, but also ideas that were brought uh, forward by um, non-governmental groups, uh, peace activists, others who tried to have an influence of how the United States redefined its international role. Um, and to compare you know, what some of these groups, the League to Enforce Peace or others, uh, try to have um, in terms of influence on the international uh, system um, and compare that with what, for example, state planning, uh, state department planning amounted to. And, um, and I think this is a very, um, quite a complex history, but, um, but also a very kind of rewarding history. It, it's, uh, it tries to open the view on, on international history as not being just maybe all too stuffy, old, boring diplomatic history, but um, a more comprehensive international history. Um, these are not very precise findings, but I think that's, that's sort of what I'm particularly working on at this point. Okay, and do you have any kind of um, a timeline for the new book? When can we expect it? Um, I have, I'll be on leave next year, uh -huh. so I hope to make quite some headway on this book then. Sure. Um, I would be somewhat surprised if I actually managed to finish it because it's quite a, a, a big book in, in the making, but in the, it's, it should come out in the foreseeable future. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today and mm -hmm. sharing some of your research. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay. For more information about Professor Coors and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Please be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Mm -hmm.